Well, good morning. How are you today? Whew, terrible. All right, good. Good. Well, my name is Nate, and um, question for you. Do you ever get annoyed with people who are different from you? Do you ever get annoyed with people who are different from you? It can be small things, big things. For me, something that just kind of annoys me is when people back into parking spaces uh, when they don't have to. Um, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's a smart thing. So growing up, my grandfather would do that. And I said, Paul, Paul, why do you do this? It takes longer and kind of, you know, what are you trying to prove? And uh, he said, you get out faster, boy. And I said, okay, well, I guess that's the wise thing to do then. Um, But that's just, we've all got things like that, don't we? Just things that kind of get on our nerves, ways that people are different from us that annoy us, right? And that's fine when it's small, but when we allow things that are different about us, when we elevate those in our mind and we begin to feel our identity around, I'm this, I'm not that, then that's when division is created. Differences can become walls when we allow them to be elevated in our minds and when we begin to view other people differently because of our differences. Isn't that true? That's just basic understanding. Whenever it's something small, like something that annoys you, it's not that big of a deal, but when it becomes more of an identity marker for you, it's much harder. We can become judgmental of people who are different than us, and we can also start to feel insecure around people who are different than us, can't we? We can judge people who are different. They're not like me. And we can look down on them. Or we can also be insecure around people who are different because I'm not like them. Isn't that interesting? We can do that with all kinds of things. But the reason I bring that up is because in the early church, there was some division that was taking place. Right now as a church, we're walking through the Gospel of Luke And the Gospel of Luke is about when Jesus was on the earth. But the original readers of the Gospel of Luke were part of the early church. And so Luke couldn't include everything about Jesus in his Gospel. He had to be intentional with the stories that he included. And I think that the story he included that we're going to look at today, he included in part because it helped speak to an issue facing the early church. And the issue was this. Just like today, we can take things that are different, we can elevate them and then look down on people who are different or feel insecure around people who are different. The same thing was happening. And it was happening because of an ethnic difference. See, the original followers of Jesus were Jewish. And the first people to, to become part of the church were Jewish. But then as the gospel began to spread, as the good news of Jesus began to spread because it's for all people, there were more and more people who were not Jewish, who were part of the church. And that created some conflict. It actually started to happen in Acts chapter 6, even before it went to non-Jewish people, it just went to people who were not from a Jewish uh, background. They were more Greek oriented, even though they were physically Jewish, they were used to a Greek culture. And so there started to be some division in Acts chapter 6. You can go read this sometime. Basically what happened is the church had a food ministry, and they would make sure that everybody in the church got fed, because it was a poor area. And so they wanted to make sure if you belong to the church, you're going to have a meal every day. And what began to happen is in the daily distribution of food, the people who were distributing things began to overlook those who were different than them. And so they would prioritize people who were like them to make sure they got food, and they would skip others. And that created, obviously, some problems. And then in Acts chapter 10, uh, Peter goes to this Gentile, and he says, you know, according to our Jewish customs, it would be wrong for me to even go in your house. And so there was this major tension. And all of it came to a boiling point in Acts chapter 15. You can go read this. In Acts chapter 15, 
they met to debate this question. And the question was this. If you become a follower of Jesus and you want to join the church and you're a man, do you need to be circumcised? And maybe you're not, uh, you didn't come today prepared to talk about circumcision. But circumcision was a big deal for the early church because um, according to Jewish Uh, scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, if you were part of God's covenant, then all of the men needed to be circumcised. And so the Jewish thinking in the early church was, well, wait a minute. We're just continuing to follow God's promises now through Jesus. Why wouldn't we require them to be circumcised? And as you can imagine, that caused some problems for many of the people who were interested in following Jesus, but that seemed like, you know, um, a problem. So all of the Discover uh, Highlands classes in the early church were filled with women. And so they were trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do about this thing? I'm just joking about that. Um, And so Acts chapter 15, they meet to settle that question. And the conclusion was, no, no. If you become a follower of Jesus, you don't have to become Jewish to do so, or you don't have to be circumcised to do so, because Jesus has accomplished all of the old covenant requirements. And so that was the conclusion. But it's interesting, that happens in Acts chapter 15. Immediately after that, in Acts chapter 16, Paul is going to go on this missionary journey, and he's going to take this young man with him named Timothy. And Timothy had a Greek dad, and so he hadn't been circumcised as a kid. And for the sake of the people that they might encounter on their trip, Paul decided that he would ask Timothy to be circumcised just so he wouldn't offend anyone that they encountered. Even though they had already decided, look, you don't have to do this, he still knew it would be offensive. Why? Because isn't that how life works? We take things that are different, we elevate them in our mind, and then we judge people who are not like us. Or we take things that make us different, we elevate them in our minds, and then we feel insecure around people who are not like us. Circumcision may not be the issue for us, but I don't have to convince you that we live in a divisive world, do I? There's all kinds of ways in which we divide. Uh, Maybe you could feel a tendency to have insecurity or judgment based on your age or based on your ethnicity or based on your gender or based on your education or based on your wealth. There are all kinds of ways that that we create division, that we build walls, because we elevate the difference and then we look down on people who are different, or we feel insecure around people who are different. Luke includes this story that we're going to look at today, in part, I think, because he wants to help us with that struggle. So what we're going to do today is walk through this text together. We're going to walk through this story And we're just going to ask a simple question. Who does Jesus honor? Who does Jesus honor? Or in other words, who would Jesus have us honor? And how can you be someone that Jesus honors? That's what we're going to see as we walk through this text. So we're going to walk through it. I'm going to point out a few things as we go. And then we're going to talk about how this story should shape our story. Okay? So Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Verses 1 and 2 give us the setting for the story. We'll talk about that, and then we'll walk through what happens. All right? When he had concluded, this is Jesus, when he had concluded saying all this to the people who were listening, He entered Capernaum, verse 2. A centurion's servant who was highly valued by him was sick and about to die. That's the setting for what's going to happen. 
It says Jesus had just concluding saying all of this. What is it referring to? Well, if you look back at chapter 6, Jesus has just finished teaching the Sermon on the Mount. That's his most famous sermon. It's where we get the golden rule, for example. And he was teaching on the side of this hill, and it was near the city of Capernaum. You can still visit Capernaum today. Today, it's mostly ruins. Um, But at the time, it was one of the larger cities in the region. And it was actually the hub where Jesus did the majority of his ministry in Galilee. It was in this city. It was an agricultural center. It was uh, a port city. And so there was kind of a fishing community there because of the Sea of Galilee. And there was also a centurion there. It says that the centurion had a servant who was sick and about to die. So in this town, there's a centurion, and here's what you need to know about centurions. Centurions were kind of like a captain in today's military. They were men who had worked their way up through the ranks. They had been battle-tested. They were experienced in uh, war and combat. They had proven their faithfulness and their strength and ability, and so now they had been promoted to overseeing about 100 soldiers, which is where the name comes from, although that was not a strict, uh, sometimes they would have more or a little less than 100 soldiers under their command. And so this particular centurion is here. Here's the other thing you need to know. The Romans loved the centurions, and the reason is because centurions were people that you could count on to make sure that law and order would take place. If they received orders, they would follow them to the T. And they were also very good at giving orders and ensuring that their orders that they gave were followed through on. So they were very orderly people throughout the New Testament. They're actually always mentioned with respect, which is interesting because even though the Romans loved them, the Jews hated centurions. The reason is, a few things. One, they were just not Jewish. And uh, the Jewish culture of Jesus' day was pretty insulated from the outside world. And so they looked down on people who were not Jewish in many cases, and that was certainly true of centurions. So they were not Jewish. They were also looked down on because they um, did the bidding of Rome. They served Rome. And The Jewish people lived in their own homeland, and yet they were being occupied by the Romans. And so the centurions were almost like the face of Roman Roman rule and Roman subjugation that they were experiencing here in their region. And so they they didn't like them for that reason. And then uh, the other big deal is that centurions were the ones who were responsible for ensuring that taxes were collected. So the tax collectors are actually the ones who would uh, collect the tax. Obviously, it's in their uh, job description and title. Um, But the centurions were the ones who would make sure that that happened. And so as you've heard before, they hated tax collectors, but they also hated centurions because the centurions supported the tax collectors. And so... Even though the centurions were loved by the Romans because of their law and order, for that reason they were despised by the Jews. And yet here Jesus is about to encounter a centurion. And this particular centurion has a problem. His problem is this, that he's got a servant who's sick and about to die. Now the word servant that's used in verse 2 here is different than the word servant that's used in verse 7. In verse 7, the word that's used refers to a young boy. So this servant that the centurion highly values and cares about is actually just a kid. And that's actually pretty rare that a centurion would care about a kid. And here's why. In the Roman Empire, it was not like today's society, where in our culture, we value children, and we try to protect children, and we send children to school, and there's just a lot of value there. That was not the case in the Roman Empire. In fact, especially for children who were slaves, abuse was rampant in the Roman Empire. And yet, here's a centurion who has a kid 
servant, and he cares about him, and he cares about the fact that he's about to die. Ordinarily, he would just be expendable, but here, the servant is cared for. So that's the setting as Jesus goes into Capernaum. Here's what happens. Verse 3. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his servant. So news about Jesus is spreading throughout all of the, the region because he had healed an entire village at one point. And so everybody who's sick wants to get to Jesus. Now Jesus enters Capernaum where the centurion is. The centurion hears about him. And so he goes and gets some Jewish elders who would have basically kind of been in uh, you know, um, the face of Jewish control of the city. He goes and gets them and he sends them to Jesus because he thinks if Jesus knew, he could do something. Verse 4, when they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, listen to this, this is going to be super important. He is worthy for you to grant this. Why? Verse 5, because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Now, think about something for just a minute. Why do they need to give a sales pitch to Jesus to heal the centurion's servant. Do you see what they're doing? They're trying to sell him on, hey, he's worthy for you to grant this request because he loves our nation and he built us a synagogue. Why are they feeling the need to do that? Because Jews hated centurions. They don't expect that Jesus is just going to go and help a centurion unless unless they can prove he's worthy for Jesus to do so. See, in their minds, okay, the centurion's not Jewish, so he's got that against him. And the centurion, he's, he's not one of us, and he's, he's not part of us, and yet he can make up for it We can overcome that, Jesus. You could still help him, even though he's not part of us, because he loves our nation and he's built us a synagogue. His actions can make up for what he lacks. You see their way of thinking? In their mind, compassion is conditional. We're willing to help this guy. Jesus, you should help this guy because here's what he's done. Here's why he deserves your help. Jesus, verse 6. Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends this time to tell him. Listen to this. What does he call Jesus? He says, Lord, don't trouble yourself since I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Verse 7, that is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. See, the Jews... This gives us a glimpse into how they viewed a relationship with God. These particular Jewish leaders here believed that for you to be worthy of honor, you've got to have some actions that prove it. Either you've just got to be part of us because of your ethnicity, or you've got to have some actions that prove that you are worthy of honor. Here, the centurion lets us know what he thinks about himself. He does not think that he has earned the right for Jesus to honor him. Instead, he has a posture of humility. 
and he is realizing that Jesus has power that he does not have. Even though Jesus is a random Jewish man and he's a Roman centurion, he refers to Jesus as a Lord. The same thing that Peter called Jesus last week. So here this centurion is humbling himself before Jesus. And he says, I am not worthy to have you come to me. But if you say the word, my servant will be healed. You don't even have to come all the way to my house. If you just say the word, it'll happen. That's how much authority he believes Jesus has. Verse 8, he explains his way of thinking. He says, For I too am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And so he realizes how authority works, and so Jesus, if you just said the word, my servant would be healed. Verse 9, Jesus heard this and was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. Verse 10, when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant in good health. There's only two different times in the Gospels that it says Jesus was amazed by something. Like, what would it take to amaze Jesus? Think about that. One of the times he's amazed at the lack of faith in a city. The only other time is here. And he's amazed at the centurion's faith. What amazes Jesus is not that he had loved the Jewish nation or that he had built a synagogue or even that he was trying to do something for his kid servant. It's possible to do those things. It's possible to do good works. It's possible to be very moral for some really sick reasons. Did you know that? That you can actually do the right thing as a way of manipulating others. You can actually do the right thing as a way of seeking your own gain. Jesus is not impressed by that. Jesus honors this man because of this man's humble faith. What does Jesus honor? Who does Jesus honor? Is it people who are from a certain ethnicity, the Jewish community? Is it people who just keep the law and do respectable things for people? Maybe. But underneath what Jesus is looking for is humble faith. Who does Jesus honor? Anyone and everyone with humble faith. The early church eventually got this right. It was hard at the beginning to sort that out. But eventually the early church understood that the good news of Jesus was for all people. And they actually became a refuge for some of the most broken people in the Roman Empire. And that's ultimately what led to their incredible spread of this news. But what's interesting to me is this idea that anyone and everyone with humble faith can be honored by God. That did not arrive with Jesus. And it didn't originate in the early church, in the first followers of Jesus. This has been God's vision. This has been God's intention from the beginning of the story. When God goes to Abraham, the very first Jew, and he calls him, 
He says, I'm going to bless you and your family, yes. But he says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and through you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. The Jewish community God set apart in order that they would help the rest of the world come to be honored by God. This is why in the book of Exodus, when they're leaving Egypt and going to the promised land, it says that there was a mixed multitude that came out with them. That means there were people who were not ethnically Jewish, who had faith in their God and said, we want to be part of that and came. This is why when they, just as they're about to cross into the Jordan, they send spies into the land to scout out the promised land. And the spies come to this house of a woman named Rahab, who was not Jewish and was not righteous by any stretch of the imagination. And yet, she became part of God's family. And she is honored by God. In Hebrews chapter 11, why? Because of her humble faith. Rahab became part of the Jewish community. She married a Jewish man and she had a grandson who married a non-Jewish woman named Ruth who was also honored by God simply because of her humble faith. And then Ruth had a grandson who would become king of Israel named David. And it would actually be that line that brings Jesus into the world. This has always been God's vision. Do you remember when we went through the book of Isaiah? In Isaiah chapter 2, God's vision for the world is that in the days of the Messiah, a diverse people will worship and work together in peace. That's his vision for the world. This has always been his intention that anyone and everyone with humble faith, can be honored. And that's why Jesus, after he goes to the cross and is raised from the dead, he gathers his followers together and he says, you are going to be my witnesses around the world. So go and make disciples of all nations. Literally the word means ethnicities. That is God's vision. And that's always been his vision. That's the story of the scriptures. Who does God honor? Anyone and everyone with humble faith. So, how should the centurion's story shape our story? And I mean that for you individually, and I also mean that for us as a church. How should the centurion story shape our story? I want to share two quick things with you. First, it should cause us to deny our insecurities and our judgments. It should cause us to deny our insecurities and our judgments. Anyone can be honored by God. And that includes you. See, in the world out there, maybe all week you feel like you don't measure up. You don't feel attractive enough as the world defines attractiveness. Maybe you don't feel like your personality is cool enough or people like you enough. Maybe your age makes you feel insecure because you're too old now or you're too young. Nobody takes you seriously. Maybe your ethnicity causes you to be insecure. Maybe your gender. Maybe your level of education or your job or how much money you make or what neighborhood you live in. Maybe what political party you're in. Out there, you may not measure up. But when we come in here, We enter by the blood of Jesus. The truth is you don't measure up. But in here, 
there is someone who has measured up for you in your place. In here, there is someone who welcomes you because he has stood in for you. In here, you can be honored, even though you're unworthy. Because in here, we enter by the blood of Jesus, who goes to the cross to die in the place of sinners, who is raised from the dead to offer you new life. So we can deny our insecurities in here. Anyone can be honored. That includes you. In here, we can also deny our judgments. Anyone can be honored. And that includes him. That includes her. That includes them. Whoever that might be for you. Whoever you might be tempted because of a difference to elevate that in your mind and look down on them. In here, that has no bearing. Why? Because Jesus, Jesus has come to bring good news for all people. And the way that we are honorable for him is not who we are, our ethnicity, or our job, or what, you know, how much money we make. And it's not what we do, whether or not we keep the law, whether or not we've built the synagogue. It's simply if we have humility to recognize that I'm not worthy and faith to trust that he is. Who is worthy who is worthy, he is. So how should this shape our story? It should cause us to deny our insecurities and our judgments. That means the church should be the most honoring place in the world. We honor all people here. The second way that this should shape our story. So it should cause us to deny our insecurities and our judgments. Here's the second thing. Is it should cause us to take the good news of Jesus to all the peoples of the earth. Think about the fact that here you are in Renton, Washington, talking about a Jewish man from the Middle East 2,000 years ago. I don't know what you've seen or read about Christianity lately, but Christianity is not an American thing, and it is not a white person thing. It is a global thing, and that has always been the case, and the only reason we're even in the room right now is because for generations, people have gone before us who got that vision. And so we must take the good news of Jesus to all the peoples of the earth. It's got to go to China and Ethiopia and Bangladesh and France and Cambodia and Afghanistan and Russia and Iceland and Nepal. It's got to go everywhere. Because Jesus brings good news for all people. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Today, as we remember this truth as a church, we're going to respond in a couple different ways. The first is we're going to take communion together. So if you did not receive one of these when you came in, you can maybe go grab that now. We're going to take this together in just a minute, and we'll give you some instructions, but go ahead and get that out and have that handy.
before we take that together, we're going to have this scripture read over us. And I want you to think about this passage that we're going to read. Because it beautifully captures how because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, which is what we're remembering by taking his supper, because of what he accomplished on the cross, we have peace with God. But he has also made it possible for us to have peace with one another. And so listen to these words, think about them, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper together.